Coyame, Mexico, a small town not found on many maps, a place swallowed up by the Mexican desert, home to more agave plants than people. Coyame is situated in the northern part of the estate of Chihuahua, and our municipality is 7,000 square feet. We have between 2,000 and 2,500 people. It's a calm place, a beautiful place. A place with no library, no archives, and no local historian. But that doesn't mean it's a town without a history. Here, history is passed from neighbor to neighbor. And it's this oral history that gives testimony to an unsolved air collision that took place here just three decades ago. It began as a civilian plane took off from El Paso, Texas, en route to Mexico City. August 25th, 1974. It was a plane that was coming out from El Paso. It was going to Mexico City, and it was an accident. They say that there was a crash between a plane and a UFO within the territories of the municipality. I don't think this could be made up. How could someone make this up? It's true. August 25th, 1974, 10.07 p.m. It's a quiet summer's night in Koyame. The town's inhabitants are beginning to turn in. 500 miles away, United States air defense systems suddenly register an unknown flying object over the Gulf of Mexico. Streaking across the sky at over 2,500 miles per hour, at an altitude of 75,000 feet, only one thing is for certain. This is not something man-made. Initial indications are that it's probably nothing more than a meteor. But 60 seconds later, it becomes clear that this is no meteor. This object was traveling and descending through steps, unlike that of a meteor, again, with more of an arc. The object appears headed on a course towards Corpus Christi, Texas. American air defense systems are alerted. 10.09 p.m. The unidentified flying object now suddenly veers left and enters Mexican airspace just 40 miles south of Brownsville, Texas. The U.S. continues tracking the puzzling spacecraft as it now races over Mexico. Yet what isn't seen on radar is a small craft headed on a trajectory towards the UFO. What's also interesting about this case is about the same time as this UFO was zigging and zagging, there was a plane that was leaving El Paso headed towards Mexico City. Under the cover of night, the small civilian plane from El Paso heads towards Mexico's capital city. But the plane from Texas never reaches its destination. At the same time, the American military watches as their unidentified flying object disappears from radar. It appears that the unthinkable has happened. A UFO plane collision. There's an assumption that there was a collision of some type where uh, both the craft and the plane had collided. August 26th, 1974, 8 a.m. Nine hours after a civilian plane disappeared over the desert, a Mexican recovery team hunts for the downed craft. Across the border, American intelligence is listening in. At 10.35 a.m., the Americans intercept the Mexican military radio report. The wreckage of the missing plane has been spotted just outside Coyame. Moments later, another report shockingly announces the sighting of a second wreck. But this is no plane. The Mexican recovery team finds a sort of a silver-shaped plastic disc, some 16 feet 5 inches, about 5 feet thick, convex on both sides, sort of like a saucer. The saucer's surface has the appearance of polished steel. It has no markings, no lights, and there are no bodies inside. However, it does appear to be damaged in two spots, possibly caused by a collision with the civilian plane and then falling to the ground. Immediately, Mexican officials declare a radio silence on all search activities. Meanwhile, 
U.S. officials reach out to the Mexican government, offering assistance in the recovery. Their offer is met with a denial. The Mexican government denied it. They said, no, all we have is just a plane wreckage. While the Mexican team collects the crash debris, the United States is busy assembling their own elite recovery force at Fort Bliss, Texas. The team includes four helicopters, three small Hueys, and a large sea stallion. Prepped and ready to move out, the team is placed on standby while U.S. surveillance scopes out the situation. The U.S. was keeping tabs again through its uh, spy, well, what I call the spy surveillance network, um, through their satellite uh, surveillance as well as uh, airplanes that were flying over at low altitude. American surveillance reveals that the Mexicans have placed the UFO on a flatbed truck and moved out from the crash site. They were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, so which led them to believe that something very extraordinary had happened. August 27th, 2.38 p.m. Unsure of what's happened, U.S. officials greenlight their rescue team. Four helicopters with team members aboard depart Fort Bliss. One of the things that seems obvious in this case is that the, the government, the U.S. government, responded very expertly, very quickly, and very organized. They had this team that assembled in Fort Bliss, and in no time were down there on site recovering this. They've done this before. But nothing will prepare the Americans for what they are about to find. Dressed in bioprotection suits, the American soldiers approach the silent convoy and find all the Mexicans dead. There is no time to investigate what killed the Mexican team, but ufologists have their theories. They somehow came in contact with a, uh, a lethal agent, a bacteriological agent that was um, from out of this world or an extraterrestrial biological agent of some sort that killed them, uh, which is my favorite theory. The U.S. recovery team quickly tends to business. It finds the 16-foot-wide silver UFO strapped to the back of a flatbed truck. The straps are reconfigured and connected to a cargo cable from the Sea Stallion helicopter. Safely secured, the estimated 1,500-pound disc is lifted up and headed back to the U.S. With the saucer gone, the team immediately turns their attention to the remaining evidence. The plane wreckage, vehicles from the convoy, and the Mexican team bodies are gathered. They gathered the debris, the bodies from the Mexican recovery team, and then they exploded them with high explosives. The reason why is to hide the evidence. Their work done, the recovery team heads back to base. Where the UFO was taken is unknown. Some have speculated Atlanta, Fort Bliss, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It is an unprecedented event, and I think it's comparable to what happened in Roswell, New Mexico. If this 1974 UFO crash was real, there was no evidence to prove it. Only the passing down of the story from generation to generation kept the tale alive, but few took it seriously. That changed in 1991. That year, not one, not two, but dozens of UFO sightings are reported over Mexico. What gives the 1991 sightings credibility is that strangers reported seeing the same thing at the same time on the same day. And yet, they were hundreds of miles apart from each other. The Mexican desert is alleged to have been the site of an incredible tale. There were rumors since long ago that an object crashed in Mexico. An object entered our atmosphere through the United States, and it crashed with a small plane. For the last two decades, Mexico has witnessed UFO incidents that rival anything reported in the United States. 
Mexicans just needed one uniting event to keep their eyes focused to the sky. That happened in 1991. In July of that year, one of the longest solar eclipses in history is set to happen. The total eclipse is visible only in a narrow corridor that includes central Mexico. A year in advance, all the Mexican people knew about the eclipse in 91. I mean, it was an event, it was a moment. All around Mexico, there were people waiting for the eclipse. It was an important eclipse because even though there have been other eclipses that had taken place until that day, they were not on the magnitude of that eclipse. Just after 1 p.m., the skies above Mexico darken. Astronomers adjust their telescopes. Millions gaze skyward. During 1991, consumer technology makes videos commonplace. On this day, many Mexicans use their cameras to capture the moon as it begins to pass in front of the sun. To their disbelief, they also capture something unexpected. It was a curious thing. During the eclipse, I heard some people who were around us saying, look, what is that there also? Several people filmed and saw metallic objects that are clearly distinguished with the form of a cupola on what is commonly called a flying object. In Mexico City, in Tepeji del Rio, in Puebla, in Cerro de la Estrella. From all corners of Mexico come videos showing a strange metallic looking object just below the eclipse. The eclipse UFOs, or OVNIs as they are called in Mexico, become the talk of the country. But while some are quick to claim that Mexico experienced a UFO encounter, Skeptics aren't buying it. This was one of the great events of the century uh, as far as eclipses and, and astronomical events. And hundreds and thousands of, of astronomers, professional and advanced amateur astronomers, came from all over the world and it converged upon Mexico City and the other towns where the eclipse was visible. Not a single professional astronomer reported seeing anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Professional astronomers immediately doubt any UFO claims and instead offer a more scholarly response. When the sun is totally eclipsed, like it was in Mexico on that day, um, the bright stars and planets become visible for a few minutes. And Venus was very brilliant, and so it was very easy to see when people looked up. And I'm sure that many of the people thought that they saw a UFO. Skeptics have their answer, but UFO believers have their doubts. Because of that, because so many people recorded in different cities these objects, some suggested that had to be the star Venus. But Venus was in a different position than the UFOs were in the tapes. It was something strange that happened during the eclipse. It's afterwards when you start analyzing and looking at the videos that you can start to see in some of them that there are movements that maybe wouldn't correspond to a planet. When you start analyzing more calmly after the fact, that's when you start to wonder if it could have been a UFO. The 1991 sightings ignite a UFO explosion in Mexico. The effect of the UFOs from the 1991 eclipse was like a snowball. And this allowed people with an interest in UFOs to record sightings more frequently. While Mexico's UFO explosion comes as a surprise to most, some ufologists believe it was actually predicted over a thousand years ago. The Maya were one of the great civilizations in history. For over 600 years, they built cities, constructed reservoirs and temple pyramids, and developed an incredible understanding of astronomy. It is incredible the knowledge that the Maya had about the sky and the planets. They had a great capacity of observation. They knew the celestial movement and were able to determine every single important event that was going to be registered in the sky. The Maya recorded their information on foldable books called codices. Most of these texts were burned by Spanish priests during the 1500s. Today, 
just four Mayan codices remain. Among them is the Dresden Codex, a document that offers an enigmatic glimpse into the Mayans' astral wisdom. It's pure astronomical, the moon, the sun, the systems, everything, everything is there. Anybody who has studied and analyzed that, consider this document a real treasure from the past. Among the information contained in this codex is an eclipse prediction cycle. The eclipse of 1991 appears in the Dresden Codex. But did the Dresden Codex predict something more? In it, they talk about the meeting with the Brothers of the Stars, which in our language we call extraterrestrials. When I read this, after receiving all these videos, that struck me, that really affected me. Because it's like if the Mayans knew long in advance that these sightings were going to take place that day. How can you explain that? Is that a coincidence? Or they knew? I think they knew. Over a century later, most Mexicans knew something out of the ordinary was happening. Their UFO wave had turned into a tsunami. Literally overnight, Mexicans are mesmerized by the apparent UFO wave striking their country. Ufologists point to the open-mindedness of the Mexican people as being partly responsible for this UFO explosion. Mexicans have been fascinated by legends, stories, elves, fairies. That psychology and sociology allows Mexicans to keep an open mind when it comes to extraordinary occurrences. When you open yourself up to other possibilities, it is much easier to accept the UFO phenomena. However, skeptics claim that Mexico's UFO wave is more of a social phenomenon than any actual increase in visits from little green men. Sightings always seem to come in waves, and these waves are generally, they correlate with the publicity, that if the newspapers or TV stations, whatever, are filled with stories about UFO sightings, people will go out and pay much more attention to things that they see. Since the earliest UFO sightings, witnesses have always been subject to heavy ridicule. They are portrayed as overzealous sky watchers who wouldn't know a DC-9 from a weather balloon. But what happens when the witness is someone who doesn't fit into these categories? What if the person has a solid reputation and career? What if the witness doesn't just know a DC-9, but flies one? Captain Raimundo Cervantes has been flying for over 40 years. With 17,000 hours of flight time, he has seen it all. Or at least, he thought so. July 28, 1994. Captain Cervantes is piloting Aeromexico Flight 129 from Guadalajara to Mexico City. He's taken the route before and everything seems in order, including the weather. Totally clear. Like we, the aviators, say. We could see the next day. Totally clear. As the flight nears Mexico City International Airport, Cervantes puts the DC-9 on course for landing. 5,000 feet in the air, he receives the all-clear from the control tower and prepares to lower the landing gear. I order to lower the front wheel. At that moment, we felt an impact on the plane. Very strong. Muy fuerte. The plane is rocked. To Cervantes, it appears obvious that they have collided with something in midair. But there is no time to investigate. The pilot has already begun his descent of the DC-9. At that moment, I declare an emergency, and I requested an area so that I can develop the list of emergency and coordinate my personnel of flight attendants because I thought we were going to have an abnormal landing. Unsure of the condition of the damage to his landing gear, Cervantes needs nerves of steel to coax the wounded jet to safety. We level the plane. We try to land softly and steady the front wheel. 
y mantener la rueda en la disco la que I was concerned that there was damage. La estuviera dañada para que hiciera el impacto con con el terreno de la pista. We lowered the front wheel and to our surprise, the plane starts rolling perfectly. Bajamos la la nariz y nuestra sorpresa empieza a rodar el avión perfectamente bien. Disaster is averted. Captain Cervantes wonders if a helicopter has clipped his DC-9 on approach. But the air tower's radar records discredit that theory. Yet an inspection of the DC-9 reveals damage and creates more questions than answers. There was a flight inspector that searched the plane who detected that one of the hydraulic lines was cut. It was cut like if it was done with a cutter. Something very strange. What caused the landing gear's hydraulic line to be cut? A subsequent investigation will place blame for the incident on worn-out parts, and the airline denies any mid-air collision. But Captain Cervantes stands by his claim that the plane hit something. That isn't the end of the story. Flight 129's strange encounter is about to get even stranger. Enrique Colbeck is an air traffic controller who was in the tower that night. Upon learning of Flight 129's incident, he instantly flashes back to a series of phone calls the tower had received earlier that evening. An hour before that flight was initiated in Guadalajara, we received phone calls from different sources. They were communicating to us that an object was flying very close to a building that is almost in the final trajectory to these runways. The sightings place the unidentified flying object right in the landing path of Flight 129. To most, the idea of a plane UFO collision seems unrealistic. But a few days later, another incident at the same airport raises suspicions that something out of the ordinary is going on. August 8, 1994. Co-pilot Carlos Corzo is helping Aeromexico Flight 304 from Acapulco begin its descent into Mexico City International Airport. The morning skies are partly cloudy as co-pilot Corzo looks out the cockpit window. The pilot's eyes are glued to the instruments. He was flying by instruments, so all his view was on the instruments. I was taking care of the surroundings and seeing outside and even take the communications and helping him with the approach. As the plane breaks through a cloud, a shocked Corso finds something unexpected. I was leaving 12,000 feet and came out of the, of the cloud and I see this big object in front of us and I really get scared. I thought we was going to have a collision and I tell my captain in a surprise expression that, oh my God, we're gonna crash. The mysterious craft streaks by the front of Flight 304, barely missing the plane's nose. It was a huge object, maybe 15 or 20, meters radio something like uh, platinum or some kind of very neat metal corzo quickly regains his composure and helps land the plane without further incident afterward he speaks to an air traffic controller who reveals that corzo's plane was in fact the fifth plane that week to report seeing an unidentified object. I can tell you about approximately 99% of pilots that I have talked to believe that we are not alone here. And the evidence that we have had confirms it. We take it very seriously because it could affect our airspace. Definitely, there is a potential danger, because we do not know what produces the phenomenon and what it is made of and why it is manifested. Nearly a decade later, another incident in the Mexican skies would send shockwaves worldwide. Yet, unlike previous encounters, this one would have everyone believing, including the Mexican government. September 15th, they come together. 
Thousands pack the main square in Mexico City to watch their president ring the very same bell that signaled the start of their fight for independence almost two centuries ago. The next 24 hours will be full of parades, parties, and celebrations. But in the early 1990s, a new Mexican Independence Day tradition is born. September 16 is Mexican independence, and we have a military parade on the streets of Mexico. For several years, we used to have an air show. The whole Mexican Air Force used to go out and fly over Mexico City. A lot of people would film these events when the planes would pass over the houses. There are many videos where certain objects are seen, flying over and passing closely. September 16, 1991. During the flyover, an amateur videographer captures a mysterious bright round object. September 16, 1992. An unidentified object is spotted flying through the sky. September 16, 1993. As a squadron of helicopters conducts maneuvers, a metallic-looking object appears to weave through their formation. Three years, three sightings. Yet the Mexican military offers no comment on the encounters. With respect to the sightings of these objects during military parades, the government never voiced an opinion for or against. The government here has always remained aloof. This comes as no surprise to the UFO community, who for decades has claimed that governments are actively suppressing UFO encounters. Blacked out reports, secret projects, and constant denials have all fed the notion of a massive cover-up. March 5, 2004. Mexico's 501 Air Squadron is on a routine search for drug smuggling aircraft. But the military pilots witness something far from routine. The Air Force in Mexico patrols the south border to stop airplanes with narcotics from South America. They regularly, they do this many times every day with different airplanes. But this day is different. During an afternoon surveillance run, the team picks something up on their radar. They assume it's a drug running plane and take off after it. Following it on radar, the object appears to be changing speeds erratically, at times traveling at over 380 miles per hour. While in pursuit, the crew turns on their forward-looking infrared system, or FLIR. It's like a camera that uh, is mounted on the aircraft, and its purpose is to look not using visible light like an ordinary camera would, but using infrared. The infrared eyes of the plane's exterior-mounted FLIR system transmits video to the crew inside. This is the actual video as seen by the crew. But as Mexican Air Patrol gets closer to the object, the crew are unable to spot anything using the FLIR or with their own eyes. And all this time that they're flying towards it, they are looking ahead of the aircraft, because that's where it says that this radar target is, ahead of the aircraft, and they're looking, they couldn't see anything. After chasing the object for several minutes, the crew determines they are too low on gas to continue the hunt. They turn around and begin heading back to the base, the unknown object soon vanishes from radar. Yet, their adventure is just beginning. The FLIR operator was still operating the FLIR, and he started picking up uh, bright lights that appeared to be at cloud level. Suddenly, appearing on the FLIR through the clouds isn't just one ball of light, but at times as many as 11 objects appear to be weaving through the clouds. The crew got a little bit spooked over what was going on because they couldn't identify these things. They didn't know what it was they were looking at. This is a veteran crew who have flown this route before and have been using the FLIR system for almost two years. But on this day, even the most experienced of pilots would be unnerved, as the cockpit recordings reveal. 
It appears to the crew the objects aren't just traveling alongside their plane, but surrounding it. Then suddenly, the balls of light disappear, leaving the scared and confused crew to return to base. Over the next several weeks, the Mexican military conducts an investigation into the incident. Crew members are interviewed, images analyzed, and weather data evaluated, yet no answers are found. It appears this case is destined to go unsolved and forgotten. Then one phone call changes everything and makes UFO history. They called me and said, we have something that is from common interest. Mexican TV journalist Jaime Masson is an expert on investigating Mexican UFO claims. Masson's impressive resume attracts the Mexican government, who asked the civilian reporter to assist. In an unprecedented move, Mexico's Secretary of Defense hands over to Masson the classified FLIR UFO video. He gave me the video and said, please be fair with the military. Please be fair with these pilots. Uh, do your investigation. You are authorized officially to do your investigation to present this in the media. Mausan is given complete access to flight records, weather reports, and most importantly, the crew members. I am interviewing these pilots inside the Secretary of Defense. This is first thing history in Mexico. They told me what they saw, they were very honest and sincere. No, we never had the opportunity to identify them visually. I never saw this kind of object before. Something that we never saw before, it never happened to us before. So yes, we had fear. On May 11th, Malsan holds a press conference to present the tape to the world. It doesn't take long for skeptics to denounce any UFO theory. Their explanations come fast and furious. It's ball lightning. You'd have a whole fleet of these top secret aircraft flying. Some skeptics and UFO investigators suggested that the equipment was not working well. One after another, explanations are given. And one after another, they are discredited. However, a new theory emerges that might solve the mystery. There's a theory that what the officials filmed out there were the flames of the oil wells that are 100 to 120 kilometers from the account. They appear to be brilliant glowing objects in the infrared. Of course, they were not visible to the eye, but that's the whole purpose of the infrared camera system is so that you can see things by their heat signature, you can see things that are not visible to the eye. Could what was showing up on the FLIR system actually be distant oil wells? Those who've examined the case have their doubts. First thing that we did was analyze the lights to determine their shape, to see if there was shape to them, and how did it change frame to frame, minute to minute. If the lights are oil wells, as skeptics have claimed, then they should flicker like a flame. But using computer programs to break down the lights reveals something very different. Over a period of frames and minutes, the glow may change on the outer edges. But there is an object in the center that is rock steady. It's a ball, it's a sphere, and it's not possible that it's a flame because if it was a flame it would be undulating not just from the edges out but over the entire object adding to the case against the oil well theory is the fact that despite flights in this area daily no one has ever reported this kind of encounter before the only way really really to prove this would be to do it under the same basis, using a clear camera, flying the same route,
brought it with the same airplane. Until that happens, the Mexican Air Force encounter remains an unsolved mystery. But for UFO researchers, that doesn't take away from the importance of this landmark case. For the first time, a government turned to the UFO community for help. Mexican UFO investigators are optimistic that this incident may signal a new era of openness by governments. This is going to produce many, many new cases and more openness in the future. There are many other people who are now trying to become investigators in Mexico. This is just the beginning. It was just the beginning. In 2005, just when it appeared things couldn't get any stranger in Mexico, they did. Since 1991, Mexican witnesses have videotaped hundreds of hours of footage containing alleged unidentified flying objects. But while the sheer volume of sightings has impressed some, it's what's on these tapes that matters. But out of the thousands of thousands of videos that we have, most of the times are, yeah, balloons, airplanes, stars, mistakes, honest mistakes. Probably just 10 or 15 percent of them are good, really good. It's this 10% that has drawn the attention of everyone from ufologists to the mainstream media. Among the most interesting UFO phenomenons captured on tape are what is referred to as fleets. A group of more than three objects we call fleets. They travel horizontally or vertically with very strange forms as boomerangs, spheres, disks. June 10th, 2004. Guadalajara, Mexico. An amateur photographer captures unknown objects in the sky. June 21st, 2004. 300 miles away in Cuernavaca, Mexico, another fleet is caught on tape. March 30th, 2005. Almost 600 miles north in Torreón, yet more unexplainable objects dot the Mexican sky. April 11th, 2005, 500 miles to the south in Mexico City. The skies over the capital city are full of mysterious aircraft. I believe it's a way that someone is using to communicate with us. I believe they are trying to, to say something similar to what happened in England with the crop formations. Skeptics are quick to dismiss fleets as nothing more than weather balloons or birds. But seeing is believing. And in June 2005, a fleet sighting had people believing. One of the more recent accounts of UFO sightings here in Mexico happened here in Jalapa, Veracruz. And it is very interesting because the witnesses were of a very high caliber. June 24, 2005. 10.30 a.m. A public ceremony is being held to celebrate the delivery of new patrol cars to the local police department. On hand are such dignitaries as Governor Fidel Herrera Beltran, high-ranking police department officials, and the local media. Moments after Governor Beltran finishes his speech, cries of UFO, UFO echo through the crowd. Instantly, all eyes are on the mysterious objects hovering above. We have as a first-hand witness the governor of Jalapa, and the newspapers published the news the next day, and it was spread throughout Mexico. Days later, a local newspaper reports that the alleged UFOs were actually balloons released by local school children. But this explanation only raises more questions for UFO believers. If they were balloons, why do they appear frozen in formation for over half an hour? As the witness says, it was more than 14 sphere objects that were shining in the sky, formed a triangle formation and remained there for 30 minutes. I just find it hard to believe that balloons could stay in the same place and in the same formation for half an hour.
I think this is an extraordinary observation because it's a governor and all of his advisors and police personnel who observed this case. Would you say to the governor that he didn't see something strange in the sky? It's those strange things in the sky that have brought together these UFO experts and enthusiasts. From all parts of Mexico, they have come to discuss the UFO wave that their country has undergone. For these men and women, the encounters that have taken place deserve attention and answers. Among the incidents they examined is the alleged 1974 UFO plane collision near Coyame, Mexico. The word is getting around somehow that something happened and that the U.S. was interested in this crash. The information that Gilberto has is very little, but the data that makes this case lends itself to the possibility that this may have been real. Three decades later, Koyame still has more questions than answers. But are there clues out there that could break the case wide open? Any motivated investigative journalism student of today, or professional, could have a field day. Go to the town, track down all the people in the town who used to be there and live there by, uh, by address and, and find them and interview them. It requires more rigorous study. Um, it requires more of a collaborative effort, hopefully, among the research UFO research communities between the United States and Mexico. So it, it's a case that's going to need more further investigation. And like any seminal event in history, there is a last second plot twist. I was recently in uh, Chihuahua and I asked about this case and there is a rumor that there are photographs around this case that I haven't seen. I was promised that I was going to receive this photographs but people there there are still afraid it seems that they have kept these photographs for a long long time fittingly once again the koyame story is shrouded in mystery did a ufo crash in the mexican desert in august of 1974 did a mexican recovery team fall prey to an unknown biological poison the truth may never be known but what we do know is that over the last 15 years, Mexico has experienced something out of the ordinary. For UFO believers, this appears to be a golden age of alien encounters. Only one thing is certain. Mexico, a land steeped in history, is now steeped in mystery.